All right. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> Just me and Chris in between you and beer. Never easy. So, last session of today. <laughs> <laughs> Little chill? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I need that. <laughs> so, welcome, everyone. My name is Christopher Mendick, and I'm senior architect at Microsoft Netherlands. And I was very happy to get that session to present today in front of you. I was even more happy when Francesco agreed to be <laughs> my demo champ today and show one lake and fabric in action. So let's kick it off. You've all seen that slide today. Sarat and Pitkin gave great presentation of fabric and its capabilities. You know already, you heard about the workload that you see there, but now we are going to focus on the foundation of fabric, which is one leak. We often refer to one leak as one drive for data. In the next couple of uh, slides and during the demo, we'll try to show you what value one leak can bring to your organization. So let's start with data lakes. So when organizations implement data lakes, they have this vision of pristine data lakes, one central place where you can put all your data in. And then from that one central place, you don't have any silos. You can make it easier to blend the data together, analyze it together, and get value out of it. And of course, because finding data in one place is easier than in 10, uh, you expect that you will get simplified security, data discovery, and data governance. But reality is a little different. <clears throat> we often say <clears throat> that analytics uh, with data lakes is currently like sharing files before OneDrive era. So for those who are old enough to remember that time, we were setting up some folders, network folders, we were mounting it sharing it, granting access to that folders, and then the whole rodeo started. People started to copy these files to their local station, update it, overwrite it, a lot of data loss in the meantime. So it was quite challenging. And then OneDrive appeared. And OneDrive initially was a file sharing solution, but it evolved to something more. It evolved to your central collaboration space to edit and work on your documents. With security settings, with governance, with labels. And this way, uh, we want with uh, one lake to make the same for your data. And it took me a while to generate that picture. Uh, I think it was six prompts uh, in Microsoft Designer, worked great. <laughs> well, done, uh, Chris. <laughs> why this picture? Because even if you invest a lot of money and a lot of time, in building the governance on the top of your data lakes. In most cases, you cover only part of your organization. There is still some kind of gray zone outside your governance, outside your security rules. And to solve that problem, <clears throat> the data mesh concept arised. And with data mesh, uh, data mesh concept, you divide your organization into so-called domains. And then each in practice, each of the domain gets own data lake. And it works great. It helps you to simplify the governance, the data management process. But at the same time, you're building the data silos. You keep separate data lakes in a different domains. And to break that, break that data silos, you start data movement. So you start copy your data from one domain data lake to another. And you create, a, you, you need to duplicate. There is no other way to do it. So you start doing that. But you don't stop there. You quickly realize that your applications cannot talk directly to your data lake for any reasons. So you start thinking of some kind of serving layers. And you build it. Cubes, data marts, uh, data warehouses sometimes on the top of your data lake. And to fill that, serving layer, you copy data again. So you create another copy of, the, of your data. And it costs you a lot of time and money to implement all of these pipelines. But that's not it. You can very quickly realize that the whole process goes out of the window 
because you start copying data from the copy of the data from another serving layer. And think, look at all of these arrows. It all means that you need to build a pipeline, you need to maintain the latest stage of your copy of the copy of the data. Why it happens? It happens because currently you're buying a storage. You're not buying data lake solution. You're buying a storage and the build data lake solution on the top of that. And with one lake, we are bringing you first data lake software as a service solution that can operate on the top of data in a different cloud. So we'll, we'll get to that. So with using one lake, our SaaS offering, it will limit your maintenance cost. It will limit the amount of pipelines you need to do. Uh, think about provisioning all of these storages and private endpoints to maintain your data, maintain your separate data lakes. You don't need to do it anymore with one lake. And there are really no silos there. You can only have one, one lake in your fabric tenant. And basically, that comes with the name, quite obvious. And your tenant admin decides where your one lake starts and when your, where your one lake uh, ends. But we don't want to make it the way that tenant admin will decide who can put data where. We want to give this freedom to your business users, to your IT users working on the data, data engineers, data scientists, to contribute to this uh, one lake. So we use the concept known from Power BI, where we organize your data in the workspaces. And how the workspace look on the one lake, you will see it, Francesco will show it. Uh, will show it. it is just a folder, nothing proprietary there. So with this way, every user can contribute to one lake. All your data lands in the one lake. And each workspace comes with own administrator, own access management, and even own capacity for billing. So if you want, you can pay for Fabric on a workspace level. And we are often challenged by our customers that, hey, we cannot have one data lake solution. We are a multinational organization. We operate on many continents even. So it's technically not possible to implement one data lake solution. And we disagree with that because one lake logically spans all over the whole world. We have currently 100K plus ADLS Gen 2 accounts powering one lake. And the beauty of that, if you have any data residency requirements, the data will follow your workspace. So if you create a workspace and you want to keep it in a specific region, without any configuration, without any change, the data will land in the same region as your, uh, as your workspace. No extra effort there, no ADLS Gen 2 accounts provisioning or any other accounts, it's coming out of the box. On the top of that, all data that lands in the one lake, they are zone redundant, which means that your data is not in one data center, but more. And since GA, since last month, you also can choose geo-replication for your data. So if you want to have data stored in the two different Azure regions, you can just checkbox and it's done. And we talked a little bit about data mesh. And in Fabric, we implemented domains that you know from data mesh as an actual feature. In this way, you can divide your workspaces into the domains. Each domain will come with own admin, own contributor, own viewer. And this way, it will help you to manage your workspaces more effectively. You get extra layer to uh, manage your workspaces. But uh, we often get the question from our customers that, hey, I don't want that all data lands in Data Lake. I, I don't want uh, that every user can contribute to the one lake because I don't want my clean IT data to reside next to the business data that are not always that clean, uh, originated by business users. And our answer to it, don't forbid your users to contribute to one lake. Because together with OneLake, we give you extra options 
to promote your best data, to promote your clean data. So we give you certification process. We give you endorsement process. You can, you, 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 we give you labels where you can uh, put the sensitivity of your data. And this way, we expect that the best clean data will go, go up within your domain, and the worst data will go down. And even if it's not happening, at least you see that it's there, and you can react on it. So far, we mainly talk about, uh, about uh, storage, but it's compute that powers one leg. And you saw that slide today already, so I will go a little bit quicker here. In Fabric, we have several engines. We have Spark engine. This is where you're going to create your lakehouse environment. This is the natural choice for data engineers that like programming in PySpark or Scala or even R, which is available in Fabric. But we also have T-SQL engine. So we never leave, as Microsoft, we never leave a SQL user behind. So with Fabric, we implemented serverless T-SQL engine that will power your data warehouse experience. So if, you, if your team is very, very expert uh, in SQL, you don't need to push them to learn PySpark. They can stay within SQL and build data warehouse there. We have KQL that will power your real-time analytics workloads. This is the place where you want to load your streaming data because it's super performant. And we have analysis services that powers Power BI. Uh, and all of these engines are natively optimized to write to the delta per cat. So you see first very important feature of one lake and storing data there. We have chosen open source for format. Delta Lake Parquet is an open source. Every engine in Fabric is designed to, to land data in that format. All your tabular data in, uh, in Fabric will land in that format by default. But writing is one thing. The more important is reading. And with reading, we also optimize all these engines to natively read Delta Parquet. But what it means in practice? Think about the scenario that you have right now. When you have a SQL table in your data warehouse, if Spark engineer would like to get data from there, he or she needs to connect through your SQL endpoint, use your compute, get the data out your pr proprietary storage, and convert it into the format that Spark can understand. With Fabric, you don't need to do it anymore. All engine can go directly to the storage layer, and that's the revolution. That is something great about Fabric. You can change your thinking about it. You go directly to the storage. So even if you write the data in your data warehouse, it ends up in the same format that Spark can read natively. And even analysis services that powers Power BI, it can go directly to your Delta Parquet file, read it into memory, and show you the data near real time. We call it direct leak mode. So what we are trying to achieve here, we want to make one lake with Fabric your center of data gravity. And one lake is opened on the storage layer. Default storage layer is open source. But we didn't stop there. We moved one step further. Every ADLS Gen 2 compatible application can read and write to one lake which means your beloved Databricks, who doesn't love Databricks, can read and write from one lake. Your HD Insights can also read and write from uh, one lake. And we had a session about it. Azure AI Studio can natively use data from one lake, where you can build your models. But we didn't stop there. What if you already have data in open access storage? Think of Amazon S3. ADLS Gen 2, obviously, maybe Google Storage. We don't push you to copy that data to one lake. We introduced multi-cloud shortcuts. And we'll take a deeper dive in the next slide. So what are shortcuts? Shortcuts are symbolic links to the data. Think about uh, the same shortcuts that we had on Windows environment. When you had a folder, you created a shortcut to it. You put it, in most cases, on the desktop. Uh, and you could directly go to this data without need of copying that. So within one lake, because each workload is uh, natively using the same Delta Parquet format, you can shortcut everything as you want. You can 
get access to any data from Lakehouse to Data Warehouse, from Data Warehouse to Lakehouse, from KQL database, and so forth. So that's quite obvious. It's great. Cross database queries is what we love. But you can also point to your, uh, to your external storages. So when you have Amazon S3, when you have ADLS Gen 2, you can just point data there, and they automatically become, become part of your namespace in one leak, unified namespace. So you can start using your fabric row workloads directly on it. And last month, during the Ignite event, we announced shortcuts to Dataverse. Dataverse is a storage behind Power Apps and Dynamics 365. And right now, you don't need to build DTL pipeline to move the data into one lake. You can shortcut this data directly and do your analytics on the top of this data without any ETL, without any data copy. And Fabric and Azure Databricks. As I mentioned, Databricks is a fantastic tool. You will see during demo how Francesco is writing Databricks data, data from Databricks into one lake. But it may happen that you already implemented your lake house in another storage like ADLS Gen 2, Amazon S3. You have your medallion architecture there. We don't push you to migrate. We don't push you to move your workloads. We don't push you to move your data even. You can shortcut these delta tables uh, and use it directly in Fabric. This works for a regular standard delta tables. If you use Unity catalog tables, be assured that our product groups are working very hard to give you the same experience as you have uh, for regular Delta tables. So expect some announcements soon. Together with Databricks, we'll announce it, that you can get your Unity catalog tables inside one lake effortless. And here I give the stage to Francesco. What a way of finishing, Chris. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. And uh, if we can move to my screen. Yeah, OK. So well, we've uh, heard a lot. So let's try to you know, really make it a little bit more concrete, right? So um, very quickly, again, one lake, center of gravity, as Chris described very well in the past 20 minutes or so. And what we're going to do in this demo, we're going to see how effectively we can bring data into one lake. And then we're going to see all the experiences that light up on top as soon as the data sits on storage, right? The idea, though, what we want to show right here, we want to show some shortcuts capabilities that we just described. Uh, we want to show also how we can use uh, Azure Databricks uh, in order to write then straight into one lake. But before doing so, uh, we will start from you know, the workspace creations, plus domains, plus capacity concepts, because those are the concepts that Chris was describing in the very beginning that then give you the opportunity to have you know, uh, data sitting in multiple different regions across the world that uh, comply with uh, the data requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, again, Microsoft Fabric, uh, nice, nice UI. Uh, we can, again, I think P-Tine in the previous session showed the different experiences. Uh, in this case, let's start with uh, uh, just creating a workspace. Um, so again, what we're going to do, we're going to create a workspace. We're going to call it MSI for Microsoft Ignite. And so here you can see that I've got uh, these domain concepts. So I can assign workspaces to domains. And just to clarify, what does that mean? It means that effectively, let's say you want to, for example, allow the marketing folks to share Excel files uh, or download the CSV files from the Power BI reports. They can do so. But then if you, for example, want the finance folks not to be able to do so, you can have different domains. And in the future, because we're investing into it as we speak, you will have different delegated settings on a domain basis. So this will give you also lots of flexibility on the edges to have you know, not just the tenant settings at the central level that uh, you know, obviously pro proliferate across every single artifacts, but you're going to have certain settings that are specific to domain, domain specifics. So in this particular case, let's say this is a marketing event, so I'm going to apply. And again, two things here, just to make it uh, more concrete. 
Uh, on the admin, um, we can go here down to the admin portal. Again, these are where you would create a domain. And then if I go into one of the domain already created, you can see the domain settings. And this is what we are investing as of now, delegated settings. So you've got policy at the tenant level that can be overwritten or changed uh, on a ad hoc basis. The other thing that domain does, it's improving discoverability of content. And so we've got this little guy here, the One Lake Data Hub. Um, and we can go into the One Lake Data Hub, and you can see that I can effectively toggle across different domains. And when I toggle across, I can find, for example, all the endorsed content specific to that domain. So it should help in discoverability of content across your environment if you're a business user. Now, we, we have our workspace, and you can see that here I've associated it to, to a domain, and I can see it here. Well, <laughs> went right on it, but uh, you could see it out there. And you can see that this is fabric content, right? This, this nice little diamond, we like that. But when we go into the workspace settings, you can see that uh, at the moment, under the premium settings, you can see that uh, this guy is sitting on my trial capacity. Now, I don't have an active capacity at the moment, but in production, what you would do, you would procure a fabric capacity or a Power BI premium capacities, because they both give you uh, access to fabric. And what you would be doing, you would be picking a region <coughs> for that capacity to exist. Depending on the region that you picked for that capacity, <coughs> When you then associate the capacity to the workspace, then the data of the workspace will reside in the region of the capacity. That's how we manage you know, one lake as an abstraction layer, but then physically distributed content across the world. Now, with that, um, let's, let's get started. Um, so again, we start Lakehouse. I'm going to call it MSA, MSI Lakehouse, create. And this, in a few seconds, uh, effectively what we'll do, under the hood, will spin up for us an ADLS Gen 2 uh, storage account. And I can start now. You can see I've got my, I can start uh, effectively loading, loading data into it. And we've got two areas. We've got files and we've got tables. Now, files is where you can check whatever you want. Think about it as unstructured data, blob, JSON, SML, pictures, you name it, document. Tables, on the other end, is where the magic happens. So in tables, we only have those delta parquet files that then will be able to be consumed and leveraged by every single um, One Lake engine. So in this particular case, I just want to start by loading data. There are different ways. We're going to see a few. The first way we're going to see is just a simple drag and drop. So I'm going to upload the file, and, uh, and now I can see the files living in my file section. Now, I've uploaded it through the UI, but the reality is that we also have got this one lake up that effectively, let me, let me see if, if I can make it happen, <clears throat> that effectively, uh, and there you go, gives me also the possibility to assign and upload data from, from within this uh, user interface. You can see my file. So I could have just copied it here, and that would have been uh, available already in one leg. The other thing that we could do is, because again, we, saw, we said open, open access, open API, right? <clears throat> it could have been adding it as a blob containers um, in, in our uh, Azure Storage Explorer. And so this is an example that I pre-created here. Uh, but you can see that, effectively, I'm passing the URL, and this URL effectively lives in, uh, in here. So you can, if I go under the properties, you can find the, the URL. So again, different ways of interacting in open fashion, depending on what you prefer, whether you're a business user or an admin, but really easy to make that data available in the context of one lake. And as soon as the data is here, by the way, you've got auditing, logging, uh, workspace, uh, RBAC, uh, RLS, OLS, you name it, right? And then in the future, we'll also have the concept of one security coming at the file storage. But as we said, the magic happens when this is Delta Parquet. 
And so what we're going to do, just using the UI effectively, we're going to convert this file into a Delta Parquet file. And uh, what will happen uh, once that's, that little process is going is that under the table section, we will have a file with a small little Delta icon uh, in there, indicating that effectively now this file is sitting in Delta Parquet. And because it's Delta Parquet, every single Fabric Engine will be able to then consume that information. So let's refresh. And you can see this nice icon. Uh, again, I showed it in the keynote this morning as well. But the, the idea is that under the hood, this is open source format. So again, no vendor lock-in. I want to be clear. Like You can use this guy, take it off. Cloud exit strategy, multi-cloud strategy, this is we're betting on open source format. Now, of course, this is, you know, an analyst maybe does this. But uh, what if you want to, you know, have a, a proper pipeline? Then that's where we can, you know, create those pipelines. P-Time as well showed a very nice pipelines where he was doing some a bit more sophisticated thing. Here we're going to keep it really easy, just the, the easiest of the copy activity. Uh, but the idea is that uh, in this case, we have got all these connectors that we connect to. And I've got the connection already set up. Uh, and I'm going just to you know, uh, copy data uh, into one lake, uh, this time leveraging this uh, UI. And then under the hood, this will generate for me a copy activity. Uh, that will then bring the data from uh, the storage uh, all the way inside my, um, my lake house. So I'm going to do some of the clicks. I'm going to say, yes, load it there. Uh, and then I'm going to say, uh, load it as a new table. And then I'm going to just change here uh, this one to integer. You'll see later why. Uh, and then I'm going to save and run. And so this, again, simplest copy activities, getting the data from storage and then copying it. Um, but again, so far, we loaded the data. But we have been sort of banging on, saying, hey, you don't have to copy the data, blah, blah, blah. So what we can do, um, and what I want to show as well, is that effectively, you can, uh, I mean, now the activity is in progress. In a few seconds, we'll be successful. Uh, and then once that's successful, effectively, if we go back to our uh, lake house here, uh, we can see that now I've got another Delta Parquet format the uh, table. Uh, we said, again, maybe, maybe let's, let's, let's see first the example of Databricks, right? We, we said, hey, by the way, we can also uh, write it uh, from, from Databricks. So we can look at the uh, ABS, uh, ABFS path um, here. I can copy this ABFS path. You have got some, uh, you know, a Databricks cluster ready to go. I'm going to just change this path here. Uh, and I'm going to run all these cells. The idea is that we're importing the same period table that now we copied through Azure Data Factory. Uh, we effectively are going to leverage uh, Azure Databricks to then, you can see, spark uh, dataframe.write.mode.overwrite uh, onto uh, one lake. So again, this is how you would leverage Databricks to then effectively having those Delta Parquet files running and landing in the context of your lake house. So when, once this job uh, is done, uh, then we, we will have this, this table that I call here uh, period Databricks table, just to distinguish it from uh, the other period table that we brought in from Data Factory. And uh, we will have this, uh, these things available in my lake house. So anyway, let's, let's wait. It will appear eventually, hopefully. Uh, the other way, again, this is copying data. But what if you know, we said, again, you don't have to copy the data all over, again, uh, all over the place. Let's say, and that's where shortcuts come to help. So what we can do, we can go on this dot, dot, dot menu. And you can see here that I've got the, the there is this little link icon. Uh, and through shortcuts, you can create pointers. Those pointers, for now, can be created to internal sources, i.e., other tables or files that exist already in the context of one lake, or external sources. And this is where you, know, you could bring in, uh, again, Databricks Delta table by using the ADLS Gen 2 connector to then you know, pull those 
information in. But for now, I want to show you the easiest one, which is the internal access. Um, and here you can see that, uh, for example, I've got um, somewhere uh, around this uh, a finance lake house that has been promoted. I'm going to press next. And I'm going to bring in a table uh, with actual information by leveraging shortcut. So this is what Sarat defined the click click. Um, I like that. Um, the click click uh, thing, I will use it more often. Um, and you can see that now I've got here these fact tables that effectively behaves as a local table, but it's just a pointer. So it keeps leaving in the finance workspace where it was created, but I can start querying it in conjunction of the table that I brought in from Databricks and the tables that I brought in through Azure Data Factory. So once this is done, and by the way, one thing that I want to call out on these fact actuals, effectively, this table is nothing but the result of a data flow gen 2 process. So you can see UI-driven approach that maybe a Power BI developer elsewhere have created, but that differently from, Power BI, uh, from data flow gen 1. Data flow gen 1, you could only write to an analysis services engine. So you could only use that piece of information in the context of Power BI. But here, we've got this little guy at the very top, and it's very small, but makes a massive difference. And in particular, what it does, it gives you the opportunity to write to these four locations for now. So that finance table effectively was born leveraging low-code capabilities and then pointing that transformations to a lake house that was the finance lake house from which we then pull the information through pointers. So now that we've got that, uh, again, we, we saw the first part of uh, you know, this, this architecture. We saw shortcuts, we saw pipelines, data bricks. Now we've got the data in our center of gravity in Delta Parquet format. That's where the magic happens, i.e., all these engines can start to query the same copy of data without having to, you know, traditionally you load the data from storage into the data warehouse, from the data warehouse into Power BI import mode. Now you don't have to do that. All those engines will be able to point to the same copy of data. And so if I go in, um, uh, in here, Again, and we saw, we, you know, we saw when I think uh, at P time, but also this morning, we saw how when we create the lake house with, um, uh, with those clicks, we also automatically provision the SQL endpoint for you to start query the data. And so, again, now if I go to the SQL endpoint of this lake house, uh, I can actually see that all my tables are here available for being queried either in SQL or, again, we saw also this morning through the new Visual Query Editor. However, again, sometimes if you've got multiple tables, you probably want to also create semantic layer on top of it, like relationship across table. You maybe want to augment it with some calculations so that then the Power BI developers can create their own report in a self-service analytics fashion. And so uh, that's where the modeling view uh, really helps. I mean, if you've built a Power BI data set, this is the same. Uh, effectively, here we've got uh, some extra tables for admin purposes. But if we go to this view, which is the date default data set objects, then effectively I've got the table that I just brought in. And so again, in, as we were used to do in, in Power BI, uh, we can basically drag and drop, uh, create those relationships, uh, and, and really generate uh, that semantic model, uh, right? So here we've got uh, the period, uh, then I've got the subsidiary against my country. I mean, the idea here, you, you get the gist, right? So I mean, this is where we, we, we create that, uh, that semantic layer, and here, we can just write DAX, uh, DAX statement. So for example, I can say total revenues, and then I'm going to say sum of, so that you don't, I don't show my, my DAX skills. And we go here. OK, here we go. Uh, and now we've got those information. Again, all those things that you were able to do, like uh, creating a display folder um, and all of those stuff, again, you can do everything in the context of the web. And now, once this is done, of course, we can move to the canvas. 
But one thing that I want to show before moving to the canvas is that if I zoom on this guy, uh, you can see that this is direct lake as a storage mode. So what we have done, uh, effectively, if you think about uh, the traditional Vertipak engine, which was the Power BI engine in import mode, there were run length encoding, hash encoding. There were different encoding uh, uh, going on in order to compress the data in a columnar format so that you could retrieve it as fast as possible for analysis. But parquet files are similar. Columnar, row groups, uh, compressions. We actually apply an additional level of compression when we write to Delta Parquet with a fabric engine. Uh, we apply V order. That doesn't break the interoperability and the open source format, but it's an operation that further compress down those Delta Parquet files so they can be even read in a faster fashion. But the idea is that they looked at the two engines and they thought, well, why don't we just build Power BI that can read directly from the Parquet? Because anyway, the Vertipak engine, proprietary format, and the Parquet file format, they can, in a way, uh, uh, they leverage some similar capabilities. And so the beauty here is that when we go here and we say, hey, give me the revenue by, I don't know, country? I mean, you see, I mean, of course, this is small data, right? But, uh, but the idea is that this is, the data is loaded in memory uh, only for those columns that we actually use. Um, and, and that happens, uh, and, and then there's an eviction process so that uh, if, if the data then gets evicted and you query the, 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 the new data again or the data is changed, then you get uh, sort of the latest, uh, latest level of information, i.e., you basically get the best of both worlds in between you know, what you had before. Before you could go direct query, but then you know, I was slow, uh, but sort of you know, real time, near real time. Uh, import was fast, but then duplicative, because you had to refresh, and then if you've got large data set, think large data set. I mean, you had to manage partitions, maybe you started with the XMLA endpoint to, to create custom partitions, or maybe you were using incremental refresh. I mean, it, it could cost some maintenance. And so here the idea is that, again, uh, even the uh, largest data set, the fact that you don't have to refresh, but Power BI is reading directly from storage is, is, is a big deal. Uh, for simplifying. I mean, at the end of the day, you're not here. I mean, yeah, of course, we all love technology, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, your organization needs to make more money, <laughs> reducing cost or reducing risk. So this is just an instrument to get there, right? And so simplifying helps you to get to those business objectives that you care about, right? Um, and uh, the last thing that I want to show, and then we didn't really talk about it uh, today too much, but I also want to call out that now we released uh, this, um, this package, which is called Semantic Link, that basically provides Python methods for read-only access to Power BI datasets in Microsoft Fabric. So we saw how different engines like Power BI and Spark can read both from one lake. But through this semantic link, now you can actually read in Spark the semantic model of Power BI, querying it and converting those queries into a data frame. So think about the wealth of knowledge that every organization does have in a Power BI report, like year-to-date, year-on-year calculation, month-to-date, all those ducks gymnastic. Now you can access it through semantic link in the context of the notebook, and then you could start doing your prediction in the notebook, save that prediction back onto one lake, and because Power BI reads natively, the same data on one lake, then that prediction could appear in your report. I mean, there's, we're not going to open this door with uh, five minutes to go, but uh, this is sort of hopefully gave you a little bit more yeah, tangible understanding of one lake, multiple workspaces, multiple capacities, bringing data in, Delta Parquet, multiple engine cross collaborating on the same thing, simplify uh, your data architecture heavily. Yeah. Chris? Great demo, Fran. 
Thank you. I think it was very smooth. And I yeah, think this is what works. we always wish. Uh, I pre recorded it, Chris. No, yes, just when we do live demo, we always <laughs> pray. We pray the sacrifices also. Yeah, you, you don't know how much I pray the demo gods. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so last few slides for today. So I hope you enjoyed the demo from Fran, who showed you how easy it is to integrate the data from outside fabric workspaces, outside one lake, how easy it is to put it uh, in one lake, use it in one lake. Sometimes you don't need to copy that. You can just shortcut it. You can use any tools you want. But last month, uh, when Fabric went GA, we also announced a new feature. And you heard about it from Sarat uh, during the previous presentation, but I will take a deeper dive into that feature. It's called Fabric Mirroring. So when your data is in an open access storage layer, you can shortcut it. You can also use uh, a lot of tools on the top of your one link that uh, can talk to ADLS Gen 2. But in the case that your data resides in a proprietary storage format, let's don't look for far Azure SQL database. These LDF, MDF files, to access them, you cannot go directly to the storage. You need to go through the SQL engine, through the SQL endpoint, and get the data out of it. And in this case, we cannot shortcut this data into one lake. It's not possible. It's technically not possible. We would have to have running SQL engine there. So what we do with Fabric, we come with the concept of mirroring. And mirroring, yes, it's there. And with mirroring, we give you relatively lightweight operations on your data store that can replicate the data from it into one lake near real time. So think about seconds, maybe minutes uh, of delay, and your data resides in one lake. And we started with Cosmos DB, Azure SQL, MongoDB, even Snowflake. And it's just the beginning. So how the mirroring works? So as we already said, the data resides in a proprietary store. We will introduce, we are actually introducing right now because this feature is in private preview. You can sign up for that. Uh, we introduce the replicator. And this replicator will use CDC technology, change data capture technology, to get all your data changes from your store into fabric. And out of the box, it will convert it to the format, guess which one? Delta Parquet. So from now on, all your data can get from your proprietary stores, can go near real time to one lake and be ready to be natively used by all the fabric workloads. And it all is done in the lightweight change data capture uh, technology. So what it means for you? It means that this data can go to one lake and give you immediate access to all Fabric workloads, which we already saw cross-database querying is possible with Fabric. All your data scientists can get access to your application data near real time and run, uh, train their models. And last but not least, Power BI direct lake mode that Fran was showing today. So we know that there are always some users in the organization that are more import important than others, and they get direct access to your data store in your application, and then they run reports directly on it, and they cause sometimes some troubles. And now you don't need to do it. You can just replicate your data near real time with fabric uh, mirroring into your one lake and run your Power BI reports on your near real time data. How cool is that? So what you see? As Microsoft and with Fabric and One Lake, we try to make sure that you don't spend too much, uh, too much time on bringing your, uh, your data to One Lake. We want you to spend your time, resources, your money to work on the data, to bring value from the data, and not necessarily to build pipelines to copy the data from one location to another. And with our tools, our openness, we want to make sure that this process of bringing data to one lake is as, possible, uh, as easy as possible. Because we think that all roads lead to one lake. Oh, it's almost dead. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah. Thank you.
We don't have time for Q&A session, but you can catch us during the party uh, after that. You can contact your Microsoft partners. You can contact us. Uh, and yeah, enjoy using Fabric. Thank you. Mm -hmm.